Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about populations. Uh, topic for the day is going to be drivers of growth or population growth. So as always, let me get you some objectives, and then we'll jump in for the day. By the end of this video, two things that I need you to know or be able to do. The first is to perform various population-based calculations. And I'm going to tell you right off the bat, there are a lot of formulas in today's video. There are formulas that you need to know and need to be able to use. College Board is going to expect that you can perform calculations with these things. So as you see them, make sure that you write them down and understand them. Second one is to discuss each of the major factors that influence the growth of a population. So that those are the things we've got. It's going to be a pretty dense uh, video today, so make sure that you got yourself something to drink, you're comfortable, got something to write on, because we might be on it for a while. So let's go ahead and jump in and start talking. First thing that I want to talk about is just a very basic driver of population growth or a way of calculating population growth. And this is something that I have mentioned previously, but I want you to make sure that you know that the growth of a population depends on just a couple of specific factors. The first of those is the number of births. Obviously, babies born increase the population. Deaths, people dying, that decreases the population. And then you've got immigration with an I, which is people moving into an area, and immigration with an E, which is people moving out of an area. So at its very base level, calculating population growth is going to depend on those things. If a country has more births and immigration with an I, it's going to grow. If it has more deaths and immigration with an E, it's going to shrink. So have that kind of rattling around in the back of your brain. Let's go ahead and start talking about some uh, technical terms that you need to know about you need to know the terms crude birth rate and crude death rate. And when we talk about crude birth rate, we are talking about how many babies are born per 1,000 people. And if we're talking about crude death rate, how many people die per 1,000 people. So the way that um, scientists or demographers would figure this out is they would figure out, all right, how many babies were born per year? How many people are in the population? Do a little bit of math. How many babies were born for every 1,000 people? Or how many people died? How many people are in the population? Do a little math there. And what was the death rate per 1,000 people? And this idea of crude birth rate and crude death rate is going to be used in a couple calculations. Um, the first one is our global growth calculation. Now, this is a very simple calculation. If we're trying to figure out what is the global growth rate per year, it is crude birth rate minus crude death rate divided by 10 that global growth number is going to come out as a percentage. So it might be 1.2%, it might be 2.3%, it might be 5.6%, or it could be a negative 4.2%, whatever the number is. Just know that crude birth rate, number of births per 1,000 people, minus crude death rate, number of deaths per 1,000 people, divided by 10, will give you your percentage of global growth. So that is working on the global scale, talking about the world in any given year. Now. If we want to take it to the national scale, we have to add a couple more figures in because if you think about a country, people immigrate and immigrate in and out of countries all the time. When we're talking about global growth, we don't have to we don't have to worry about people leaving the planet and coming to the planet. But if you're talking about a national growth rate, you've got to account for people moving into and out of the country. So, if you are doing a national growth rate calculation, that's going to be crude birth rate plus immigration with an I, those are your inputs, the two things that are adding people to your country. Subtract from that the crude death rate minus immigration with an E, and then divide that by 10, and it will give you the percentage growth for whatever nation you are calculating. So recognize if you're working on the global scale, it's just crude birth rate minus crude death rate divided by 10. If you're working on the national scale, so for a specific country, crude birth rate plus immigration minus crude death rate plus immigration divided by 10. And this is probably one of the formulas that you'll need to use most frequently in AP Environmental, and that is doubling time. The idea behind this calculation is how long does it take the population of a nation or the world to double given a constant growth rate? And this is a very simple thing to do. Double time is called the rule of 70 because it is equal to 70 divided by the growth rate. So let's say that, I don't know, let's just give you an example here. So I'm going to say doubling time, dt, is equal to 70. And then let's say that you have calculated a growth rate of, I don't know, 10%. This country is growing super, super fast. So divide 10 into 70, and your doubling time 
is equal to seven years. So that means it will take seven years for your population to double. Um, if your growth rate was 7%, then obviously it would be 70 divided by 7, which means your doubling time is equal to 10 years. Um, this is something that you're going to see frequently. Anytime you see in a question, how long does it take a population to double given a growth rate of automatically in your head think rule of 70 70 divided by whatever that growth rate they've given you or you've calculated all right a couple of things that are going to drive the growth of a population when demographers look at populations and try to figure out all right what's causing this population to grow or shrink the following things i'm getting ready to talk about are the major factors i'll look at and the first one is fertility fertility is the number of children per woman so if you take all of the births that happen in a country or a city in a given year. Divide that number by the total number of women who are at reproductive age. You will figure out what is the average fertility of a woman. So does a woman have, does the average woman have one kid? Does she have two kids? Does she have four kids? That's the fertility. And based on where in the world you are, the fertility is going to be different. And I'll talk about why that is in a few seconds. But just know that fertility is the number of children per woman. And using this idea of fertility, we get to the idea of replacement level fertility. And this is one of the things that we talk about if we're talking about a country growing or shrinking. So first thing, at its base level, replacement level fertility, this term right here, is the number of kids that are needed to be birthed per couple in order to keep the population at a steady state, which means neither growing nor shrinking. So obviously, if you've got a couple, you've got a mother, and you got a father, eventually that mother and father are going to die. So in order to keep the population stable, each mother and father need to have two kids. That would be the replacement level fertility because it would take two kids to eventually replace these two parents. So depending on the country you're in, that replacement level fertility is going to be different because it's quite possible that one of these kids could die, which means that this couple actually needs to have three kids and able to uh, replace themselves. So country like America, most developed countries, the replacement level fertility is right around two. In America, our replacement level fertility is 2.1 kids per woman. So that means that for the American population to remain stable, every woman needs to have 2.1 kids. Obviously, you can't have a tenth of a kid, so some are going to need to have three kids, some are going to need to have one kid, but the average would be 2.1. Now, if you go to a country that has got a high mortality rate, high infant mortality rate, so let's say you go to a less developed country, this replacement level fertility could be, I don't know, three and a half, four, something like that, because that means that each couple is probably losing one or two kids. So in order to keep the population stable, the average woman needs to have four kids. And obviously some are gonna have more, some are gonna have less, but just recognize, Developed countries, the replacement level fertility number is going to be much lower than in an undeveloped country where there's going to be higher infant mortality and thus higher replacement level fertility. And speaking of the development of a country, one of the other things that drives the growth of a country is life expectancy. Life expectancy also indicates the development level of a country, and life expectancy is basically how long can a person expect to live if they were born in a certain year. Um, in developed countries like America, life expectancies are going to be pretty high because we've got good nutrition, most people have got shelter, you've got access to good health care. So in a place like America, the average life expectancy is something like 60 or not 76 or 77 years. However, if you go to a country where, let's say, AIDS is very prevalent, some places in uh, South Africa have got an adult infection rate of like 23%, places like that, the life expectancy might only be 40 years because people are <clears throat> dying off fairly quickly. Um, if you live in a country that is less developed, the average life expectancy is going to be much lower. Um, another thing to recognize is that in general, the life expectancy of women is generally higher than that of men because men tend to take more risks, they tend to work in more dangerous jobs, they tend to generally lead a more dangerous lifestyle, so they are not going to be expected to live as long. And while we're talking about the development of country and numbers, and going back to that last slide on life expectancy, um, <clears throat> countries with a higher life expectancy may have more stable population growth than ones with a lower life expectancy. And we'll talk about that when we talk about demographic transition in a couple of slides. 
The next factor that drives population growth I need you to know about is infant and child mortality. Now this is calculated again per 1,000 births, so it's kind of like crude birth rate. If we're talking about infant mortality, we are talking about the number of children that do not make it to their first birthday. If we're talking about child mortality, we're talking about the number of kids that don't make it to their fifth birthday. Now, this is another indicator of the country's development level. Countries that are less developed tend to have a higher infant and child mortality because there isn't care. There isn't access to prenatal care, babies get sick, children get sick, they get hurt. More developed countries tend to have lower infant and child mortality rates. Now, there are a couple caveats to this. Um, if you look at this graph over here on the side, you see very low infant and child mortality rates. Up here you got Sweden and Japan, somewhere around 2.6 to 2.8 kids per thousand don't make it to their first birthday. But if you go all the way down here to the bottom, you will see America with a rate of, it looks like 6.37, just ahead of Croatia, Belarus, and Lithuania. So America has historically had a relatively high infant and child mortality rate compared with our level of development. So we're a highly developed country. Unfortunately, within our country, there is broad gaps in social status and wealth. And so those who tend to live on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum tend to have higher infant mortality rates than those that are on the higher end. Um, you can also look within a country. There are some places in America that have got infant mortality rates as high as third world countries. So that points to uh, parts of our nation that may not necessarily be as developed, where people don't necessarily have as much access to health care, um, and where conditions generally are not as good. So you can figure infant and child mortality for a country, but recognize that within that country there may be broad variations. And just a couple things to wrap up on. Um, Another thing that is going to affect the growth of your population is going to be aging and disease. Obviously, this is going to be something that is going to decrease the growth of your population. Um, the biggest killers worldwide are heart diseases first. So worldwide, heart disease kills the most people. The second one is transmissible diseases. And those are going to be diseases that are transmitted from one person to another. Excuse me. In specific, um, HIV is going to be obviously one of the big ones, especially in sub-Saharan African countries. And then you've got waterborne diseases um, and insect-borne diseases that are going to do a lot of the killing worldwide. So if you live in a country where heart disease is very common or where disease killing people off is very common, then your um, country obviously is going to have a lower growth rate than a country where those things aren't as common. All right, two things to wrap up on. Um, you need to be very familiar with the age structure diagram, which is something that I have mentioned previously, but I want to come back to it and give you a couple comparisons. So basics on an age structure di diagram, things you need to know. They are always split between male and female. The numbers at the bottom are the percent of the population. And each one of these bars is a different age category, usually broken up by uh, four to five years. So this bar down here would be like zero to four years old. Up here would be like five to nine and then so on and so forth all the way up until you get to like 85 to whatever. Um, three shapes of population pyramids that you need to be aware of and things that you can tell from them. So if the age structure diagram looks like a pyramid, meaning a really broad base with a narrow top, this means that the bulk of your population is not yet of reproductive age and this is a really good indicator that your population is about to explode because as this big old chunk of your pyramid starts having kids they're going to leave bigger chunks of a pyramid behind them so a pyramid like this indicates your population is going to grow very quickly if you have got a much smaller pyramid like this then your population is going to probably remain steady and stable it might grow just a little bit but it's not going to be a whole lot of growth. If you've got something like this that looks more like a column where the bulk of your population is middle-aged to older, this means that your population is going to shrink over time because these bigger parts of your population are not no longer having kids so they are leaving smaller parts of the pyramid behind them, smaller generations, and as they die out of the population your population is going to shrink. So example countries uh, countries with a regular pyramid that are going to show quick population growth, Kenya, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, many third world countries. 
Um, lots of developed countries show pretty stable pyramids, so Australia, Canada, United States, and then there's a lot of developed countries around the world that actually are experiencing shrinking populations. Examples of this, Austria, Denmark, Italy, Japan would be another one that you can throw in there. And this is your final slide for the day. The last thing we want to talk about is uh, migration. And obviously migration is probably going to have one of the biggest impacts on the growth of a population. So there's a balancing act between immigration, immigration with an E, crude birth rate, crude death rate, that calculation I talked about at the very beginning of the video. As these factors balance against each other, you're going to get the growth rate for a nation. So if you live in a nation like America, our crude birth rate is fairly low, okay? Somewhere around two births per thousand women. But our immigration rate, people moving into America, is fairly high, so we have got a pretty decent rate of population growth in America. Other countries, like if you go to some Eastern European countries, their crude birth rate is pretty low and their immigration with an E is pretty high, so this means that their population is shrinking as people are moving out of the country. Um, you could go to some sub-Saharan African countries where the rate of immigration with an I is pretty high, people are moving there, but there's also a high crude death rate, so there's a lot of people dying, which means your population is going to balance. So recognize that all of these factors work with and against each other to balance out and give the population growth of a country. And the last thing I want to note is something that I didn't actually make a slide on, probably should have. A term that you need to know is population momentum. Let me write this up here so that you can see it. So population momentum. Population momentum. And Sorry, words are hard when I'm thinking and writing. Um, population momentum is the idea that birth control measures uh, enacted on a population take a while to go into effect. So let's say that a country has put into effect a program that educates um, women about birth control. The effects of that program are not going to be seen for multiple years because obviously it takes time to learn the lessons and then to actually slow down birth rates and for those ideas to circulate throughout the culture to where they impact the culture as a whole. So population momentum is basically the idea that birth control measures may take a while to actually become effective before a population growth starts slowing down. And that's it for the day. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Um, I hope this little tutorial on population growth was helpful to you, and I hope you'll join us again. Thanks.